name's Stonesy Boy, and welcome back to Reading with Stonesy. Sorry if I'm a bit more lower tone today. I'm actually kind of upset because we have finished uh, Danganronpa version 3. If you think I'm upset now, wait till I'm upset because we finished the entire game series. Then you'll know the true meaning of despair. No, I'm just sad because that means I'm not going to be able to play uh, that game with all those characters. I think so far version 2 is my favorite, but then again I've only played 1 and 2, so I don't think I can say that for fairness. But yeah, we just got done beating that, so, you know, I'm a bit sad. Because I think what I have to do is move on to Phoenix Friday's Attorney now, which I really don't want to do. But at the same time, time I kind of want to do at the same time, you know? It's like a 50-50, but it's like, eh, it's okay. Anyways, uh, so yeah, today we're reading from 67 to 70, 63 to 77, which is going to be 14 pages. Shouldn't take that long. And, uh, yeah, let's begin. Chapter 8, A Building Project. Harvesting wood, storing up the tower, the last area before nightfall. Stax was convinced that some terrible creature, one of the drowned, if not something even worse, would be working in the shallows, waiting for him to stay far from the shore. He wandered in up to his waist, ready to retreat to the relative safety of the broken tower, then peered into the water, alert for any sign of danger. But there was nothing. It was a beautiful day, and the water was gentle and cool. If not for the terrible things that had befallen him, he might have been able to pretend he was on some carefree exertion, taking a dip after a day of the seashore or on a long hike. Tentatively, Stax swam out to the keel of the capsized ship and heaved himself up onto the spine of the pale wood. He could tell at the glance which planks were rarely, if ever, submerged because they were bleached by the sun and free of seagrass. What that had colorized wood before the surface of the water. Stax ran his hands over the wood, looking for a weak spot, and found his, a place where the planks had warped slightly and sprung apart. Wincing at the pain in his hands, he began forcing working the planks back and forth, until one gave way in the groan of distress. One down. Goodness knows how many to go. He set a plank carefully aside in a keel next to him, and looked for another weak point. Within half an hour or so, he had a stack of planks, and a keel was starting to look like giant worms. It had been gnawing at it. Nax Stax rubbed his arm across his sweaty forehead and looked back at the stump of the tower, trying to calculate how many planks he needed to fill all the gaps in the stonework. The sun was directly overhead, about to begin its descent toward the horizon. For a moment, the task seemed too big for him, and he grimly certain he couldn't be finished by nighttime. Then he shook his head. That was no way to think. He'd do whatever he could, and if the job was still incomplete, the sundown, he'd hide in the sand back again, bank again, and hope his luck held. Stacks worked all day as the sun sank in the sky and sweat ran down his neck. He worked until his hands were raw and cramped, and his back was stiff and his knees hurt. He was hungry and thirsty, and whatever he stopped for a moment, he thought of his ruined house and his lost cats. He felt disappeared, creeping into the mine. Then that happened. It happened several times during a long, hot day. He swam awkwardly back to shore in a lot of wood pile it near the tower. That way, when he got tired again and looked back at the tower, he'd immediately see he was making progress. Finally, with the sun nearing the horizon, Stax wadded ashore with the last armload of wood. And the inside of the tower was cool and shadowy, and... He was glad to see, free of vermin, briars, or any other unpleasant things. Stax thought about the brief rest, but he knew he shouldn't. It wouldn't do to wake up, discover the sun was down, and drown out. one of the drowned was putting his hands around his throat. One thing to do, he thought, was make a crafting table. He grabbed several planks and ten minutes later produced a serviceable table in which he could work. Another hour of work, he banged together a door out of planks that fit into a doorway. Then it was time to begin filling the gaps in the stone. Stack sweated and hammered and sweated some more, annoyed with himself each time he made a mistake then had to start over. The sun was in an orange ball on the horizon, which he wedged plank into a gap between two stones. Stepped back and realized there weren't many, any more holes in the tower. They all had been filled and cockeyed, haphazard way of his grandmother would have approved of, maybe. But then Stax had nothing but scavenged materials, half starved. He allowed himself a brief moment of dissatisfaction, after which his eyelids had started to droop. That was when he remembered the bed. Was he too late? He peered between the blanks and saw the sun had sunk almost out of sight. No, he still had time. But only just pushing open the makeshift door, he hurried down to the beach and where he had left his bed, overshooting it 
but then stopping it and the gloom behind him. To his relief, a long day beneath the sun had dried it. There was a gurgle somewhere behind him. He heaved the bed onto his shoulder and forced his tire legs to run, his feet kicking up sand, making it back to the tower, and shut the door behind him. Careful not to dislodge it, he took a piece of scrap wood and jammed it into one of the lumps of coal, hoping not to break it. Coaxed in, in flame, jammed a scrap wood into the rusted sods of the wall. Warm yellow white filled this refuge. Stacked just hoped it would repel any monsters that spotted it and thought the cracks of the boards instead of attracting them. Stacks lay down on the bed, moving his shoulders back and forth to rearrange the clumps of wool inside it. It was lumpy, stiff, and with salt, smelled damp, and, and the frame might give way in the night, dumping him into the tower's flagstones. But in that moment, it felt as soft as inviting as a feather bed back home. Stack sighed. He knew he should get up, and he should perform the last check of his hasty repairs to make sure he couldn't be battered down. But he was bone-weary, his mind fuzzy, and his energy utterly spent. I've done the best I could. I just have to hope it's enough. A moment later, he was asleep. Chapter 9. Gifts from the Sea. Stax makes an aquatic discovery. A hated food from childhood gets reconsidered. Remedial tool use. Laughter in the dark. Stax woke with a start, but this time he knew exactly where he was. His stomach clenched and turned over, demanding food he couldn't give it. Stax clearly op carefully opened the door. The beach was quiet. The water serene beneath with the rising sun. Stax scanned the shore of the signs of trouble. So disturbed and realizing how he felt already I've come to now this miserable little bay. Maybe that was his future to memorize each hummock of mud and drift to sand. Each particular of this drunken, forlorn world. But then if he couldn't find anything to eat... And soon, that problem would take care of itself. Stax kicked through the ashes of the fire and hoped he'd miss another apple or something else useful in Fueg's raiders had left behind in their hasty departure. But there was nothing. Stax struggled up on the sand hill where he spent the night hide hidden from the drown, giving little hollow to his refuge. A brief glance before forcing himself to look away. This situation was dire, but now at least he could have a roof over his head, however haphazardly patched, and a bed. He stood at the top of the hill, sheeted his eyes with his hand. Gazing out into the desert and turning slowly around in the full circle, he surveyed his surroundings only briefly during the night. While under attack, it was entirely possible he missed something. A patch of wood, say, or a mouth of a river. Why stop there, Stack asked himself. Why not a farm with a full barn wool of warm hay? An inn that doesn't charge travelers for rooms. A castle whose aged owner needs a young heir. But there was nothing but low hills of sand marching to the horizon, broken by green spikes of cacti and little and the brittle sticks of dead bushes, remnants. Stack supposed, by some bygone era, the, when these shores had been green and pleasant, Stacks mechanically gathered the sticks, thinking they might be useful as firewood, and dumped them in the patchwork tower. He started out to sea, hoping to sight something, anything that might deliver him. His belly rumbled again. Fish. He could make a fishing pole. He just gathered an armload of sticks, but he had no line. At home, they used spider silk for fishing line. But he thought of the battling a spider in the night made Stack shiver. No, that wouldn't work. He couldn't see anything beneath the water except sand and stones and kelp. Kelp. A stray memory from childhood came back to him. His father unloading his boat after one of his trips across the sea to tour Stonecutter Outpost. He landed Stacks a chunk of dried kelp, explaining that he'd eaten it during travel and inviting him to take a bite. Oh, how Stacks had hated it. It was tasteless at first, t tough and chewy. And then the tang of salt overwhelmed everything. Staxer spat it out into the water, running his finger around his gum and back across his tongue in an effort to get rid of even the smallest bit of it. Well, now he had to learn to like it. Stax swam out to the overturned ship, its keel almost stripped, stripped of planks. Now that he was looking for kelp, he could be see that the wreck was surrounded with strands of it, reaching up from the seafloor toward the sun. Stax wrenched a plank three. Held his breath and dove into the water, forcing himself down as far as he could go. The sea floor here was a strange gray. Gravel, maybe. Or clay. Whatever it was, it would have to wait. He yanked at the surprisingly tough stalk of kelp until he was desperate for air. The stalk finally parted. Sex kicked for the surface, gasping in his head to clear the water, and draped the length of the kelp over the sheep's keel. He heaved himself out of the water and sat on the keel while he got his breath back. Pieces of kelp were floating nearby. But then he rested a bit. He collected them. through. Th there were more, more of them than he thought there would be. Wait a minute. It wasn't the kelp he saw floating. Something shiny was out there, too, glinting in the sun. A dead fish, maybe? Sack swam out to it, worried it might sink. In his astonishment, it was a compass. He held it in his hand, awkwardly treading water, and gazed down at the red needle. He supposed it must have fallen overboard while the raiders were making their getaway. Sack's father had carried a compass with him during his ocean journeys, and Stack tried to think back to what he told him about how they worked. 
To his frustration, he realized he didn't remember all the details. There had been something about an origin point and making adjustments from there. During the exploration, Stack's mind had wandered. He had already known that he had no interest in sailing across the seas of the overworld, and if he ever changed his mind, his father would ne be next to him and be able to take care of the navigation. But it was useless to get angry at himself about having to listen to a long explanation back when he was a teenager. The important thing was that Stax's father had used a compass to find his way home, and Na Stax now had no one of his own, which meant he could get home, or close enough. His father had made those adjustments that Stax couldn't remember, but close enough would be a lot better than his current situation. The thought of being able to get home was so amazing that Stax shivered despite being in warm water. He shook the compass gently, half wondering if he was dreaming, but no, it was very real. Stax reminded himself that he had work to do. If it wasn't as if he could just start swimming in the direction of the compass was pointing, clutching the compass in hand, he swam back to the keel and set his discovery carefully on one of the highest planks. While he rested, he peered at the patchwork tower. He had plenty of wood, enough even, to replace some of the tower's stone blocks. That would let him use a stone for other things, such as rebuilding a furnace. If he built a furnace, he could dry his new supply of kelp using his precious stock of sticks and new lumps of coal. And once the kelp was dried, he'd have food. And then, he was so excited he almost tipped over his thoughts and made himself calm down and start again. Then I can build a boat, use the compass, and go home. But first, he needed that stone, and he needed it relatively quickly. The sun was high in the sky at home. The days had seemed to crawl while he wasn't doing much. Now it felt like the sun was racing toward the opposite horizon in a moment it rose, leaving stacks too, with too much to do and not enough time in which to do it. Stacks thought of when he had a small and his grandmother had walked him through puzzles like this, asking what steps he needed to take and what order he needed to take them. He supposed she never imagined her grandson might have to draw them those lessons in situations like this, lost and marooned far from home. Or maybe she had. She'd been a formidable woman, with stories she found equal parts thrilling and terrifying. Had she escaped from a nest of creepers, maneuvering them in fact so that they blew themselves up, but they barely hurt her, but blasted a hole into the cavern and provide rich and iron ore? Had she escaped a near-fatal fall by tunneling her way back to the surface in total darkness with her pickaxe worn down in a mere nub? Sax wasn't nearly as brave or resourceful as his grandmother had been, but maybe, he mused, she might be proud of what he'd accomplished. He had survived a night battling the drowned, after all, and turned the Shadow Tower to a reasonably safe refuge, and now, if he just kept calm, he could get himself home. He climbed her back onto the keel, careful not to knock either the compass or the kelp into the water, and started hunting for planks that were partially straight and strong. He found a few and wrenched from free, checking that they were free in soft spots. Then he gathered the kelp, stuffed the compass into his pocket, and made the by now familiar swim back to the beach in his tower, taking the straightest board and stoutest stick he could find. He hungered down at a crafting table and got to work. Sax wasn't sure he was quite right to call what he made a pickaxe. It was more of a pry bar made of wood, but it would have to do. And to his relief, it did. By mid-afternoon, he had assembled eight stone blocks into a furnace and filled it with sticks gathered from the desert. He used the torch to light the sticks, but help the kelp in the furnace top slot, and waited impatiently for the kelp leaves shrank and changed from a green to a dark gray color. Sax was so hungry that he burned his fingers, snatching the first piece of kelp out of the furnace and had to juggle it for a couple of minutes while it cooled. He bit into the kelp and made a face. It was bad to remember, salty and chewy and thoroughly nasty, but it was also what he desperately needed. But it was also what he desperately needed. By the time the sun sank below the horizon, Stax had eaten six pieces and a dried other dozen or so for tomorrow. Something grown outside the door, close enough to make Stax jump. With the night have fallen, the drown have returned. I know it's delicious, but you can't get your own dried kelp, Stax yelled, shocking even himself. He heard footsteps squishing away from the door and began to laugh. A low chuckle had heard from a helpless scream of giggles. Stax lay in his lumpy bed, one hand pressed over his mouth, but he couldn't stop the laughter. I think I'm losing my mind. Maybe so, but at least he wasn't going to starve to death. No, I'm not. And tomorrow? Tomorrow, I'm building a boat. Chapter 10. Back to Sea. Stax put his father's lessons to work. A reluctant decision and several promises. A science of making weapons on a beach. A brief aside about the nature of storytelling. A melancholy nighttime chorus. The next morning, he started back building his boat on the bench. Beach. He Stax found his thoughts drifting back to his family. Stax's grandmother always preferred to travel by land, disdaining boats and both dangerous and waste of time. If he closed his eyes, he could still hear her complaining about them in particular in the ocean and the travel in general. What's the use? All that time traveling through something you can mine. You can't mine. I'll go by foot, and by the time I get where I'm going, I'll find two more places where we can pull a fortune out of the ground. Three, if nobody hurries me. But Stax's father had loved boats, 
and been comfortable with them. More comfortable probably than he'd been underground with a pickaxe in his hand. He'd been the one who taught Stacks how to make a boat by carefully overlapping planks. He made several boats that way, to escape travel far from home, and wanted to make sure his son had the same skills. Stacks had never imagined having the use of that knowledge, but now he was hardly glad he listened to his father's long ago lessons. Over the better part of the day, the boat took shape, though Stacks had spent an annoying amount of time getting the planks to fit just right. And finally, the boat was finished. Stacks walked around it, and expecting it a critical eye, it wouldn't do. I wouldn't do to have put in all the work only to have the thing sink a minute after he put it in the water. Or far worse, an hour or a day he put it in the water. That is an awful looking watercraft, Stack said, and his inspection was complete. He started to talk to himself more and more during the last couple of days and only wished there were a cat or two to pay no attention to what he said. The boat was indeed terrible looking. His father had made him trim elegant boats out of birch or oak, and sometimes returned from long voyages in a new boat made from some dark exotic wood harvested from trees that hadn't grown near the stonecutter estate. Stax's boat was a mess, made from different woods of varied colors, most of it bleached by the sun, tinged green by water, or both. If Stax was being honest, the boat was spotty and blotchy and vaguely diseased looking. The oars it made weren't any more attractive, one was sickly yellow-green while the other was vaguely misshapen. So what? Stax asked himself. If this boat gets me home, I'll hang it from the ceiling of the new trophy room. Home. That's what Stax wanted to do. Desperately wanted to do was get to the boat right now and start a journey back to the place he missed so badly. The idea of spending another night on this miserable shore, trapped between the hostile sea and the bleak desert, seemed unbearable. But he knew it wasn't a good idea. He was tired, and the journey home would be difficult and dangerous. It made much more sense to begin at dawn. When he rested and stronger, was able to go ashore in daylight if something went wrong. Sex knew that, but it was so difficult to accept. With a sigh, he turned away from the water and sat down on a rock, pulling a chunk of dried kelp out of his pocket. They took a salty bite and chewed mechanically, grimacing at the taste. If I get home, he said with his words muffled, I am never, ever eating this nasty stuff again. Sex finished his unpleasant meal and stood more, uh, morosely on the shore, kicking pebbles onto the water. He decided to spend the rest of the daylight hours making a sword out of wood. It wouldn't be much of a serious fight, but it would be better than fighting with his bare fist again, and he could use it if he was lucky enough to encounter animals anywhere on the way home. A wild cow, perhaps, or a pig or a chicken. The thought of chicken, to say nothing of beef or pork, made his mouth water, and he spent some time daydreaming about food. Just a few days ago, a juicy steak or a plump pork chop had been a regular meal, as had a loaf of fresh bread or potato. Now those foods seem like the kinds of things that a king might eat in a fancy hall surrounded by servants. Sax made himself a promise that he never got to eat like that again. He wouldn't take it for granted. He appreciated each and every bite and each of every meal. Then he finished making his sword, shaping and sanding the edge until it was sharp as one could make a piece of wood salvaged from a keel of a wrecked ship. The sun was just touching the horizon now. To his surprise, Sax wished it were later. Even though that meant the drowned would be prowling around this pitched-together tower, the sooner the night came, the sooner it would be morning, and the so- and he could finally depart. Stax made some experimental thrusts and sweeps in his new wooden sword, like as if they felt in his hand. When he gave his boat a pat and retreated to the tower, shutting the door behind him. Not long after the sun went down, he heard a drowned tampering around in the dark, moaning wetly. But the sound had become familiar, and it was much... Lost much of its hair. If those mindless unfortunates were going to bash down his door, they would have done it already. With luck, this is the last night he would ever hear those awful noises. Now, here's a funny thing about storytelling. You can see for yourself that there's not a lot more to the story left to go. We're done. So you already know that Sax is going to simply sail home and you have everything turn out okay. But even though you know this, heroes have no idea how much is yet to come to the story. Sax has done everything he could do to prepare for his journey. And he really was confident that it would go well. So let's leave him there, in his bed, happier than he'd been in several days. He went to sleep with a smile on his face, despite being surrounded by a chorus of gurgling moans that made a hungry things want that wanted to eat him. And that's it for the day. Like I said, decently short. Anyways, I think next reading, which is tomorrow's, is going to be longer. Which is going to be 78 to... A hundred and I think it's 101 last time I checked 101 10 oh it's 100
78 to 100, which means it's the first time we get to move this to the right. Woo! Then we get to do it again later when we get to, uh, we get to do it again next time when we move it one more time when it gets to 100 to 120, which is exciting. So yeah, next time we have to read 22 pages, and yes, that is the correct math on that. I know my mathy math. Anyways, hope you guys have a super fantastic, wonderful day. If you like, be efficient, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next time.